All right, so good evening everyone uh, who will watch this later and I see Stephanie and Alex here. So what we will do today is same like we did uh, last session. So the first hour I will spend some time going through some topics on chapter 3 which is some basic statistical concept. I assume that most of you have taken this as an undergraduate and, and maybe in your sophomore year to know, you know what is a t-test and um, type 1 and type 2 error but actually I didn't um, so I'll assume that some of you haven't so let's, it's good to just go over those topics uh, just to simply understand you know what is that we're doing uh, in t-test what do we mean by p-value because you know these are some fundamental concept of the class so if we don't get those concept correctly then any analysis that we are doing uh, will be ambiguous. So this is probably the last lecture where I'm going to go through a lot on theory or somewhat to the theory. Uh, for the next uh, eight or nine weeks that we have, you'll mostly see, you know, we're going to focus on the code, on the bioconductor. So we'll run a sample code, and in the next session we'll review the homework. So like last week, this is a week we'll just have to spend a little bit of time uh, on, on some of the fundamentals of uh, statistical analysis. But going forward, you'll see me doing strictly uh, programming or, or script review. So, so the first session will be dedicated to that, right? As I'm saying, t-test, p-value, and error rates. And maybe we can look at one of the solution for the task one uh, that uh, you were sort of requested to do but not required to do. And then we should jump into bioconductor. So I'll give you a very gentle introduction to bioconductor. You know, some very simple capabilities. You know, how you can read cell files, how you can look at some specific probes. You know, how can how you can look at some values. And if time allows, uh, we can um, uh, start working with the package and processing data and analyzing data. I don't know whether we can do all that in a couple of hours, but if we cannot, uh, definitely next week, you know, when we review the homework that you, that's due on February 22nd for your R, which I believe is probably the simplest homework that you will do on assignment one. So as we review that, you know, we will also um, review the uh, Biconductor package if we don't get much time today. So, <clears throat> very simply, again, you know, I try to do keep it simple so at least I understand it, which is let's try to understand, you know, what do we mean by a t test, right? And uh, all of this should be clear to you because I'm assuming that on Monday when I read the uh, uh, uploaded the lecture three. The lecture three, I try to give you as much detail as possible uh, to show you, you know, what are these different uh, distributions and t tests and and, and etc. So first of all, why don't we talk about, you know, what is a normal distribution? Again, it's a very uh, simple concept, but let's just look at it. So I think I have this here. Okay, so let's look at this picture of normal distribution. And I always have problem when I'm sharing to open up any kind of PDF file. So, hmm. maybe this would work. PNG and PDF. Okay, so so this is a normal distribution that you're familiar with, right? So you have some data here and some measurements that you have taken. So you have the frequency here and the values. So what normal distribution basically tells you that in this region, which is the dark blue, 34% to 68% of your value is within this dark blue region. And 26% of the values are under this light blue region. And very low, about 2% here and 2% here on the very light uh, region. So this very light region on the right, we call it a tail, right? So this is also called a tail. And your mean is right here in the middle for normal distribution as defined by mu. So what you mean by one sigma here and minus one sigma here, so that's your standard deviation. So if you have a data point here, so that means it's one standard deviation away from the mean. Or alternatively, you can say you're pretty much 34% of the values on the right side of your distribution where the markation of 34% values can be found. That's one standard deviation away. 
and on the left side you know if you have another 34 percent values located so that's also again one standard deviation away so that's the concept of standard deviation and the normal distribution a lot of the assumption that we make with our data is um, uh, that the data is normally distributed but that's actually not anywhere near a close of an assumption because you know your data actually may not be normally distributed and if you talk to a hardcore statistician he or she might ask you to say do you know your distribution how do you calculate your distribution so it's a big topic just to understand you know what your distribution is you can do a lot of modeling to understand is your distribution normal or is it some something different so we will not get into that that much but let's just understand very simply you know this this is what normal distribution looks like and I hope you understand what's the concept of uh, a standard deviation which is either your data is one sigma or two sigma away and what percentage of value actually constitutes what so that's a pictorial uh, description of normal distribution now we have to understand the concept you know what's a null hypothesis and what's an alternative hypothesis okay so let's try to understand it in terms of our class let's assume that um, Give me a second. And I think I need to go to the right a little bit. Okay. So let's assume here that you have a sample, just one sample, one gene, one probe. And uh, that sample and that data value of that particular probe you have done across 11 arrays or 11 samples or 11 subjects whatever you want to call it then now you're proposing right that's your hypothesis that's your null hypothesis is to say that the mean of this one sample is 7725 right so that's your null hypothesis so your alternative hypothesis would be it's actually not equal to 7725 so it's going to be one or the other either it's 7725 or it's not 7725 so this is a one sample that you are concerned with so now we're going to get into the uh, concept of what's a t-test right so t-test which is also known as student t-test is a method by which we can either prove or disprove our null hypothesis so it's a way to it's it's a mean it's a way to our mean right so there is a formula in how you can calculate the t-test so let's work out through this formula and try to understand why did it work out the way it did so now let's assume that these are your values across the 11 samples right so some of the values are low let's say 5000 and some of the values are high let's say 8000 and the big assumption here based on the picture that I showed you that this is a normal distribution right so you have some value at the low percentage of the tail which is the left tail I showed you and then you have a very high value on the right tail and somewhere in the 50% region you have a value of 6515 and on your 75 percentile quantile is, is about 7515 right so you can actually write a single simple formula in Excel and say you know what is the quantile and what quantile it belongs to based on your data range that's from G sorry based on your data range that's from G11 uh, to uh, G21 right so if you're proposing a mean that is 7725 so your 7725 is probably somewhere between the 75 percent to 100 percent quantile now that should kind of give you an idea that if my data is already above the 75 percent quantile is it really my mean so think about it right so because if if it's a mean it should be in my opinion somewhere between 50 some quantile right there right in the mid middle that's also median so from the picture I would say it's somewhere there but when I do that I, I kind of see that the mean is already greater than 75 percent so that's one quick way to look at the data but I think we have to go to a method now to make sure that either to accept the hypothesis to say mean is 7725 
or reject the hypothesis to say mean is actually not 7725. Okay, so these are our five uh, in 11 values. The formula for t test. Okay, so now as far as t test is concerned, there are two types of tests that you can do to approve or disapprove your hypothesis. So let's look at a slide. One is called a Z test and another is called T test. So let's understand what is Z test and how Z test is different than T test. And I'm hoping I have that slide here. Um, so it could be over on this one. Give me a second. Again, I have problem opening it, so bear with me. <clears throat> okay. So the definition of z-test, as you see here, what it is saying, that z-test is used to test hypothesis about mu. That means I'm proposing a hypothesis about mean, right? So as you said, saw in my previous example, I'm proposing that my hypothesis is uh, 7725. But you will only use z-test when you know what is the standard deviation of your population. Now in some scenario, if you're very lucky, you might know what is the standard deviation of your, of your entire population. By population, I mean that if you had a way to know that, let's, let's pick a gene called FOXO gene, right? So if you have a way to know, to say, I know exactly you know, what the mean value of that FOXO gene is across every single human being in this world, that's something we do not know. But if you happen to have a scenario where you knew that what the standard deviation would be between you, me, or someone else, and if you knew, if you had that data with confidence, then you can actually use z-test. Your challenge here is you only have a sample of 11 subjects. You have no idea what is going on with another billion or five billion people in this world. So you will not be able to use z-test because you do not know the standard deviation. So all you know, so you have to clearly understand what's the difference between sample and what's the difference between population. So in your case, you know the sample mean, which is coming from 11 subject, but you have no way of knowing or nor will you know what is the standard deviation of, of 6 billion people and, and their samples. So in that case, the best thing that you can do is use the t-test. So that's the difference between t-test and z-test. Now, as far as the formula of t-test is concerned, and here we're only talking about the one-sample t-test. So very soon, we'll talk about the two-sample t-test. So for the one-sample t-test, you you're only talking about one gene. You're not comparing this gene between two different samples, right? So when you have, let's say, a condition where I have five samples from a, a tissues treated with drug, and then I have another five samples from tissues uh, not treated with drug. So that's a two sample comparison. Here you have 11 samples and assume they're all coming from healthy normal tissue, so it's a one sample, but you have 11 of them. So in that one sample t-test, for you to calculate the t-value, what you have to do is you have to calculate the uh, empirical mean right, which is just simple arithmetic of number of values that you have divided by, sorry, the value of each of those 11 samples divided by 11. So that's the mean I think we learned in, I don't know, third grade or something. And then you have the population mean, which, you, which is the mean that you're proposing. So which is either could be true or not true. So we'll figure it out. So that's the mu. And Sx is your standard error. And standard error is nothing but your standard deviation that you can calculate like the way you did uh, for your mean from the population. This is not the true standard deviation, but your sample standard deviation. right? And you divide it by the square root of number of samples. So that's your formula on t-test. So let's go back to our Excel, and that's exactly how we're doing, right? So first is we have to get the empirical mean or sample mean, right? So here is my formula for sample mean. And my sample mean is simply the average from G11 uh, to G21. And, and bear with me, because this topic is so simple, because maybe it's just boring you to death. But let me just finish it. 
And the standard deviation is nothing but, you know, standard dev from G11 to G21. And your number of sample is 11. So then what I do simply is, you know, I took the square root of n, right? And the population mean, which is the mu over here, we don't know that yet, but for now we're proposing that the population mean is 7725. And now we have to figure out, you know, whether our null hypothesis holds or do I reject my null hypothesis. So if you plug in all the formulas, right, so what you get, you know, you divide your uh, difference between sample to population and you divide it by the SEM or standard error of the mean, which is standard deviation by square root of n, you get a t-test value of minus 2.82. Now what? So now that you got your t-test value of minus 2.82, now you need to make the connection to say that t-test of minus 2.82 is that significant. Did you get that t-test by chance? That if you had a normally distributed data, that any kind of random samples that you could have picked, right, could have also given you a t-test of minus 2.82. So if it's just by chance and you compare with any other data set and anyone else picking those seven sample could have also got this kind of t-value of minus 2.22282, that means there is no significance, right? So if there is no significance, so that means that you actually have to reject your your hypothesis but so now we're going to compare this t, t value that we have minus 2.82 and go back to a, a p value from that and see whether we accept or reject our hypothesis so before you can actually compare this t value the one thing that you have to do is you have to establish a confidence interval so this confidence interval so you can have so let me just go back to the picture here uh, of the normal distribution. I don't know where I kept it. Maybe I closed it. <clears throat> Sorry. wrong one so the 95% confidence interval means your mean that you're proposing if this is the 7725 that's the mean that you're proposing right so on the 95% confidence interval based on the t value you have to predict so for 97% you have to consider two of the tail right so so that's what you have to do is the whole thing over here is 100% so the way you define the 97% confidence interval is you 100 minus 97 is 3% so you assign 1.5% to this particular tail and 1.5% is to this particular tail. So now the t value that you calculated, if that falls right within your 97% confidence interval, right? So that means it's not a critical. That means if you could have done it by random and you could have had that same t value either here or there or there. But if it falls ex outside the boundary of 97%, that means the t value that you calculated if it falls somewhere here or somewhere there that means that's a very very critical that's that's not likely that you got it by chance so in that case what you will do you will reject the hypothesis and you will actually accept the alternative hypothesis so whenever you get a t value that's extremely low most most of the cases and that extremely low t value will result in a low p value and when you define your confidence interval, whether it's a 95% confidence interval or 97% confidence interval, and you have to actually consider two sides of the tail. 
and I'll talk to you a little bit why when you consider one tail and when you consider two tail but now that you're considering two sides of the tail right so then if your t value after calculation shows that it's falling on either the left tail or on the right tail at the outside the boundary of the 97 percent so that means it didn't happen by chance so that's the fundamental that you always have to remember now as far as one tail test or two tail test is concerned if this is the one sorry if this is the one that you are proposing your mean to be and if your alternative hypothesis says that the mean is actually greater so whenever you go to the greater direction then you only consider the right side of the tail whenever you consider the less than condition then you go to the left side of the tail so if you're either greater or either you are less so you only have a one tail t test because if it's greater you are only concerned does my calculated t falls in this boundary you don't you don't care whether it falls in that boundary and if it does fall in that boundary obviously it's not greater right so you don't care in, similarly if it's smaller then it has to fall in this boundary so if it's already falls in this boundary that means it's already greater so vice versa so any kind of equality your uh, is always two tail because if it's equal then the t can fall either on this side or that side but if it's a greater or less than, uh, so, uh, then you have to t consider the one tail uh, test. So that's that's. I hope I made some sense. But again, clarify by reading things and you know, go, you know, by doing some Google. But that's bottom line. What it is, you have to understand what is the confidence interval, what are the critical regions. Then you calculate a t based on your sample, and that t, where does it fall? Does it fall outside the threshold, or does it fall inside the threshold of 97% or 95%, whatever it is? Now, when you when you decide a p-value, right? So there is no magic in p-value of 0.05. So when many times people use the value saying, you know, I want to make sure that my p-value is less than 0 0.05, that means I have excellent finding. It doesn't really mean anything. All it's saying that you know you have a 95% confidence interval, and so left over is 5%, right? So your p-value of 5% means that it could be on, you know. 2.5% here or 2.5% here. So there is no golden rule for you to say p-value of 0 0.05 or p-value of 0 0.01 or p-value of 0 0.003, right? So, so there is nothing written anywhere that as soon as you find something as p-value of 0 0.05, you're good to go. So you have to think about these things like, you know, what what threshold that you're using, who told you to the threshold, so then it will be up to you to either increase or decrease your threshold. So always you have to remember in statistics, it's just everything is just a number, but whatever finding that you're leading to, and as you'll see these in the homework, the number is not the key. It's the adjustment that you have to do to those numbers to say, let me run this pass by p-value of 0 0.05. Let me run a second pass by p-value of 0 0.01. And then compare your result to see, does that make sense according to the paper or biology that I am aware of? So if a p-value of 0 0.01 makes perfect sense to the publication or article or biology that you're seeking, that's when you actually have a good finding. But if it doesn't make any biological sense, you cannot validate that against anything, then your experiment is flawed, your analysis is fault. So don't get misled by this number. Always keep the number uh, to context. And that's the advice I've always given uh, when, you know, when I have tried to teach this class. Now getting back to just wrapping up the calculation here. So that's why significance criteria is 0 0.025, right? And the reason I have is 0 0.025, it's uh, if you take the 0 0.5, 0 0.05, right? So you divide it by 2 because I have 2 tail because I'm testing equality. So I have to consider the right side, I have to consider the left side. So on each of the tail, it will be 0 0.025. The other thing is, uh, you can actually derive, so I have to show you the t table. Now based on your t value that you got and based on your significance criteria that you establish, you need to know the degrees of freedom and these two parameters will actually give you to p value. 
Now let's understand very simply, and I always like to show that because I always try to understand things in very simple terms and in and, and Excel and with picture. Because if you do not uh, cannot explain things in very simple terms, that means either I don't know it or this topic is not clear or I cannot explain it. So try to keep things always simple. By the time it's already too complicated, that means we are lost. But that's my philosophy. So for the degrees of freedom, what happens is, so there are five balloons here, right? So that's n equals to five. In our case, we had 11 balloons. So when the first person comes in, you have a choice to pick any of the five. You can pick any color. So as soon as you, let's say I pick the blue, so as soon as I... Sorry. So as soon as I pick the blue, the second person that's coming in can only choose out of the four only because the blue is gone, right? So what happens end of the day, the four person when we have picked, and if you happen to be the free, free fifth person, you actually don't have any freedom. You, you are you have no choice but to pick the last balloon that's left. So always subtract 1 from the number of values that you have. So 5 minus 1 is 4. So over here, the degree of freedom is always 4. So in your example, if you had 11 balloons, and one is take, and, and so you subtract 1 from that, so your degree of freedom is 10. So that's the magic, right? So you calculate your T, you, cal you establish your threshold, you know your uh, the degrees of freedom because of 97.5% 5, 5 confidence interval, so that's left over on, on uh, sorry, this is actually 95% confidence interval. So then for 5%, so 0 0.05, so for both two tail tests is 0 0.025. So then what you do, and let me show you the T test, um, a T table, and I apologize, I had a very long day at work today, so I didn't get to organize things the way I would have wanted to. So many of you have seen it, or I I'm assuming most of you, all of you have seen it, but let's just look at it. This is the T table, and that's where you actually go from those three parameters to your T value. And you will never need to do this anymore because R will already do it for you, but just wanted to spend an hour or 40 minutes to make sure some of those uh, theories are clear to you. So you're doing a two-tail test, right? So you actually have uh, degrees of freedom of 10, and your criteria is 90, uh, for the two-tail test is, uh, sorry, 95% confidence interval, 0 0.025, right? So 0 0.025 is actually somewhere here, so between 0 0.02 and 0 0.01. So degrees of freedom. So your T value according to the normal distribution, right? And you can just write a simple formula to, to, to get to that. So actually, when I say 97.5% confident interval uh, for the two test, so it's 0 0.025, so 10. So it will be between 2.76 and 3.169. Right, so if you just had a, 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 a you know normal distribution and you randomly pick some value out of that distribution, your t based on the criteria that you establish, which is ninety seven percent confidence interval for a two tail test right um, I hope I'm doing this correctly, so t actually should be over here right ninety seven five percent point zero two five okay. So for the two tail of 0.05, it will be 2.228. So when I look at my t test value that I got, so it's minus 2.82. So 2.82 is already larger than 2.228. Okay. So then I, but I can also show you by this calculation here. So then what you actually do here is your empirical mean is 6,700, which we calculated. The T cumulative from T table is 2.228 for 97.5%. Um, and the, these are your standard deviations. So what you do, the T test that you got, you multiply it by SEM. Then you add it to your mean. And then you also subtract it from your, uh, from, from your mean. So what you are saying that you, with a 
5% confidence interval if your t value is 2.228 so any the mean could be lying somewhere or for a normally distributed data anywhere between 5986 to 7520 what you are proposing here is 7725 right so 7000 725 does not fall within the acceptance region so you're going to reject the null hypothesis okay so so that's the basic idea of what falls within the region what doesn't fall in the region what are the three different parameters that you need so I want you to think about these particular values I want you to think about the things that I am saying in this lecture and if you agree or disagree I want you to write to me okay so again so that's the example that I give you gave you for one sample but if you have a two sample which you will always do so that means you will have a normal tissue and then you will have a uh, tissue treated with drug and you're gonna have a bunch of values so in some array the value is let's say three in some value arrays a value could be six the same uh, same um, sample in another array for the normal tissue could be six Right, so I'm just outlining some values here, some 9, some 14, right? So if you put as an average for the particular sample here, it could be 4.5, and the average here could be 8. So if you just purely look at the average, it almost tells you that this is a two-fold change, but so which is you can also use a full change. So full change is nothing but take, you know, summing up all the values and getting a difference, but instead of relying on the full change, you actually have to do the t-test to, to and establish a, a criteria like I did here, 0.025 or, or uh, 90, which is 90, or 90 or 0.05, you know, whatever you you know, want to work with from, and then prove to say based on this criteria that I have uh, given, uh, either the genes are differentially expressed or not. So we will not rely on full change in most of our homeworks, but we will actually use the t-test uh, to to get to it. Okay, so it's already 636. I want to move out from the T value and P value concept and just make sure I talk to you about the other ones, which is type 1 and type 2 or error. Now, every You guys are um, not able to hear me? Um, how about you, Stephanie? Do you hear what I'm saying? Where is the... Um, now, I, now you can. Okay. <clears throat> So let's say what the w the best way to describe it what I have found is so let's say that you did a test right in that test you are finding that genes are differentially expressed between two samples so if your null hypothesis in our scenario right for gene expression will always say that there is basically no difference between 
two different sample types for this particular gene. What I mean is you have a control uh, sam tissue with normal healthy samples and you have a drug treated sample and you have some values of uh, for a particular gene, let's say seven in one of them and eight in another one of them. So null hypothesis is there is no difference there is no full change, uh, sorry, there is no difference, there is no expression, uh, differential expression between these two samples. So that's the null, hy null hypothesis. Your alternative hypothesis would be that there is actually difference, right? So when you come up with a test result where you're concluding that your genes are differentially expressed, expressed you're rejecting the null hypothesis. And when you are actually concluding based on your t-test that genes are not differentially expressed, you're actually accepting the null hypothesis. And I apologize, it's a very difficult topic, statistics for me to explain, but I'm just trying my best. So when, when you concluded that your genes are differentially expressed and you rejected the null hypothesis, and if you did it correctly, what happened? you actually correctly identified a true value. That means you concluded that the genes are differentially expressed. And let's say someone knew the result. This is an assumption here. And he and also validated that, Tamar, you did it correctly. So what I did in that case is I actually found a true positive. This is also called the sensitivity, meaning I want to detect as much true positive or true value as possible. Conversely, let's say I concluded that uh, genes are not differentially expressed and I rejected the null hypothesis. Um, I didn't reject them. See, I even flumble. I did not reject the null hypothesis and someone in the background with all the knowledge in the world told me that timer, that's correct. Those genes, that gene across these two samples were not actually differentially expressed. So what I did, I actually concluded a correct negative conclusion, so that's true negative. So when you are in this space between predicting a true positive, saying yes, genes are differentially expressed, or in the space of true negative, saying genes are not differentially expressed, and someone is validating for you with all the data, and statisticians make a lot of assumption. So when you're in green space, so it's a true positive or true negative. Anything else that you'll do in this quadrant, you're actually committing an error. And that's the key. So you can either commit a type 1 error or you can actually commit a type 2 error. A type 1 error happens when the genes are not differentially expressed, but you are concluding that they are differentially expressed. So that's called a false positive error or type 1 error. right? And conversely, type 2 error is when you're actually saying they are not differentially expressed, but they were actually differentially expressed. So you concluded a false negative error. So I think it will make more sense when you look at this Excel spreadsheet and think through it, the four different combinations that can happen, and what are the different errors that I can that you can do and what particular space that you need to be, which is the green space. Now your your thoughts here, our thoughts here from statistics point of view is if you just take a normally distributed value that I showed you, right? And you got very excited and you did a p-value of 0 0.05 and you did an analysis across 1,000 genes, uh, 10,000 genes, right? And but if you are doing that with a confidence level of only 95% chance that you know your your uh, uh, value is going to be within the threshold, but you have also 5% chance where actually you're going to get those differential expression just by chance, right? Because your p-value or your confidence level is not 100% your confidence level is 95%. So you have a 5% space where you're going to commit an error. And if you commit that error, you're going to have 500 genes just by error showing up and to show differential expression. And those of you who have very strong biology, you know very well that 500 genes to show up by chance is not going to help you in, at all. Because you may have thousands of genes, but the particular disease or the phenotype that you're studying, there could be only five, four, or in some cases a single gene that's very critical.
So if you come up from the IT department and get very excited and hand over this data and say 95% confidence, you know, I'm saying you these genes are expressed, then they're going to probably not be very happy with you because you have a possibility of committing error where 500 genes just showed up by error. So the next step to take is do not always rely on this normal distribution. I would say just do not rely, assuming your data are normal distribution. Don't stop your analysis just on simple t-test. Try to use different advanced methodology where you can actually control your type 1 and type 2 error. So the next question we would ask, so if not normal distribution, if not t-test, what else is available so we can do a better analysis and we can do, do things with better confidence? One very simple method that you can use is called FWER, which is family-wise error rate. That's also called a Bonferroni correction. And I think in the lecture, it's very nicely explained, so you can read it. So all that you are doing there is you're multi, so you get a p-value, let's say 0 0.05. Right? So all you're doing is you're multiplying that p-value by the number of genes that you have. But this method is not really applicable because when you come to think of it, if you establish a p-value of 0 0.05 originally, which is f based on your normal distribution, now you're thinking, oh, you know, this is not good enough because I have a chance of uh, 500 genes to be showing up by by error. So then you have a number of genes, let's say 10,000. So when you multiply that 10,000 by 0 0.05, it becomes even lower. So if it becomes something like 0 0.00005, then you are also in a difficult situation because you may not have a single gene that had such a low p-value, right? So all I'm trying to say is that Bonferroni connection, because it multiplies by the number of samples or experiments that you did, and in our case, we have a huge number of genes, but very little sample. So we end up getting a very, very low value. So Bonferroni connection will probably not work for microarray analysis. But what does work, perhaps, is you can talk about the permutation method. So what permutation method does, it simply just swaps the label. And, and you, as you go through the lecture, probably, I don't know whether it was clear to you or not, but we show you a lot of tables where we're actually swapping the sample labels and try to see after swapping, does that still make sense to conclude based on the normal distribution. So I talk about a ex uh, simple example here. So let's say you have two arrays, just to think about very simply. And you have three genes, right? So I don't talk about the value here. So let's say on array one, you had 12 and array 2, you have 34. So these are your intensity values. So it's a two-sample t-test, right? So you have, I don't know, I'm just going to type in some random numbers here. So don't think about these things. So you do a two-sample two t-test across the values here. So these are different genes. So you, when you did that two sample t test for the first gene, you have a p value of 0 0.01. For the second gene, you have 0 0.02, and for the third gene, you have 0 0.03. So what this happens at, with the original level, when you do a simple p, uh, t test based p value, so we will term this as p value unadjusted. So in your case, the unadjusted p-value is 0 0.02. And no matter how complex topic you talk about in future that I will tell you to do an assignment, whether it's SAM or multi-test or whatever package it is, is basically taking your unadjusted raw p-value, which you get from simple normal distribution, and throw some additional criteria there, perhaps not as stringent, as Bonferroni, so by after multiplying by thousands of genes, it becomes so small that it's no, not so useful. You try to come up with some more advanced technique to just sort of lower it but increase your confidence level. So with Bonferroni, that's, since you're putting a very stringent con uh, um, criteria, the statistician will say with this criteria, you'll only commit one error. But we can say, oh, OK, my worst case scenario with normal distribution is I'll commit 500 error on a, sim on a simple example for five that I gave you. Uh, Bonferroni is saying, OK, you'll commit one error. So how about I say I will commit about 95% uh, error of my samples? 
So when you have uh, a particular experiment, so even the Affymetrix does an experiment with, uh, let's say, 20,000 genes, but if you're an investigator where you're only interested in a subset of genes, let's say 1,000, and you can define your criteria to say, as long as I commit like uh, a 1% error, I'm happy. Right, I think I'm, I'm I'm going in the good direction. So you can define it as a percentage-wise, you know, what error is tolerable, or you can go as a number to say, as long as my error can be can be contained within uh, 10 genes, but not 500 genes, then I think I'm going in the right direction. So these are some of the parameters that you have to play with. It's not written anywhere, but you just kind of have to do a lot of experiment, a lot of changes in this parameter to get to a conclusion. So then how you do that then, in this simple example, what you will do, now that it's your raw value is 0 0.02, one of the simple technique of the permutation method is you're going to swap the sample. So what used to be array 1 here, now it's going to become array 2, and, and array 2 is now going to become array 1, right? So then you're going to do the gene 1, gene 3, gene 2, right, whatever you whatever you had. So in that scenario, after you did the swap and you did the t-test, what happens here, your gene 2 is actually become, in, over here, originally your gene 2 was 0 0.02, but in this case of p-value, your gene 2 is actually now giving you a p-value of 0 0.03 after you do the swap. So what you will do, end of the day, so if your, the, your adjusted p-value is going to be the number of times it is actually less. So in this scenario, let me draw another one. So if you did this, and let's say you had actually three different arrays, right, and array three. So you can swap three different ways. It's a permutation and combination. So let's say in this particular scenario, it was 0.005. Right? So this 0 0.005 is actually less than your raw value of 0 0.02. So your adjusted p-value is actually going to be 1 over 3. Right? And let's say you did the uh, 3 times you did the permutation. So that's the basic idea. And then you can again re-review your lecture 2. So that's the simplest concept. And I think a couple of more modifications that have been made kind of gets into a deeper level of percentage. And I think there's some examples with U and etc. And for the SAM, it talks about some probabilistic adjustment. But that's some of the topic to understand very deeply. You really need to take a graduate level statistics course. And as I said, mentioned before, that I will try my best in my capability to give you a brief idea of what the background or theory is. But the capability that I really want to work with you for you to build is on scripting because that's where my strength is, either in R or in Bioconductor. Okay, so it's 6.51, and that's pretty much the concept that I wanted to cover today, which is you understand the t-value and its dependence on normal distribution, and uh, and how you go from t-value to a p-value, how the establishment of this p-value criteria is basically up to you, just don't rely on 0 0.05. Make sure that p -value, when you start with a t-test, you're actually doing the simple one is normal distribution. But if you do everything based on normal distribution, you can commit a bunch of errors like type 1 and type 2. So then you have to move a step up from the t-value to more matured or more uh, sophisticated techniques to control this error, not as extreme as Bonferroni. But you can use multi-test package for permutation method, or you can also use SAM, which is a very advanced technique. And on lecture four or lecture three, I think we'll talk about we'll do an exercise on SAM. Um, let me see if there is anything else I'm missing I wanted to cover. And there is um, actually a slide here on. Um, statistics and you can review it so it's basically talking about you know how do you establish what is a full change what's a normal distribution and how you know in R you can run some of this code so this is a good one and I will um, 
copy it uh, on the um, assign on the web session to folder so you can look at it right so this gives you a very pictorially very good like what's the variability between these two genes and when you come up with a number does this value mean value here and compare with that you know do you really see a difference or not so this is a good slide um, so take a look at it and then it will also give you an idea of null hypothesis and significance criteria etc okay so now let's start the fun part which is uh, our R okay so what we will do today and let me maximize it So what we reviewed last week is R. R is the language that we're using. We talked about R being an object-oriented language. Everything is an object. So after you do your homework, you will get an understanding of the basic data type and, ob and objects that you have in R, which is we talked about the vectors and the list and data frame and matrix and um, <clears throat> environment you know these are the different data types uh, that you have and after you go through the homework and we review the solution uh, next week um, you know we can again take another pass at R just so we understand uh, the, uh, the basic objects so what bioconductor does it it actually takes those raw level objects that means R comes with a built-in object of a vector comes with the built-in object of uh, uh, of a list so in an object oriented language the advantage is you actually use or leverage an existing type of object and you build on top of that object another object that's that's uh, that's meaningful to you for your analysis so for example if I have a text file let's say that someone gave me and in the text file I have a column that tells me this is the experiment name another column that tells me it was done in Holland another experiment tells me it was done on 11 subject another column tells me out of those 11 subject five were male and six were female so this is what we're talking about a phenotype right so then what we can do we can actually get the text file and we can read that text file and store it into a data frame right so we can actually start by leveraging the data frame object that already comes with R and on top of that data frame object we can construct another object called phenotype right so that's how you act that's what bioconductor does bioconductor uses the existing R objects and then puts the standard objects on by which you can actually open the cell files, you can store the cell files, you can store information about the experiment with the cell files. So I highly recommend that right now after this lecture you read chapter 2 you read what's showing in chapter 2.2 .2, and the most critical part that you really need to understand and I don't know how I can explain this in a lecture pay a lot of attention to section 2.4.2 in your textbook where it's talking about building an expression set from object I cannot emphasize more how critical this is because going forward you know I'll be talking a lot about you know what is your uh, expression set um, object what is your uh, phenodata object so you have to really pay a lot of attention from page uh, I would say from page 12 to page uh, th uh, 18 to understand what's an expression set, right? So, so please do pay attention to that. And I think one of the things that I will do in the assignment is I will just give you a simple text file, and that text file will have uh, maybe some probe names on the rows and some uh, samples on the columns, and I'll have some numeric values. So, one of the tasks I will ask you to do is to construct your own expression set. That means your your own object where you can actually store this data of gene a value just like the way you had in Excel right in the task you had some columns where the samples were there and the other tissues and the rows where the probe sets were there so instead of Excel I'll give you a text file and your homework assignment would be out of that text file to construct an expression set object from scratch so that's coming up on your homework too so 
the the way to get the bioconductor packages so what I mean by that again is you are going to next homework assignment construct this expression set object right but there are tons of packages and I think there are 400 of them I forgot the last count that actually does a lot of different things already for you there are packages where will actually read the date cell files for you there are packages that will tell you the associated with CDF file for you there are packages that will do the t test that I showed you for you and even going far it will tell you based on the probe name you know what's the uh, what's the name of the gene you know you know so that's the, the annotation part of it so different uh, component of the analysis that you have to do for all of them different packages are available so going forward the aim of the course will be to sort of slowly understand those packages what package does what and kind of put them together based on the homework assignments that you will have the way to get the package is to do a source this and you have to do it from your R command when you do a source command what it's doing it's pointing your R session to the internet um, to the web browser the web browser or where these R packages are available so all the the basic uh, um, R packages are available and this is the installation package in R which is called bioclight.r. So when you issue this command from your to install the bioconductor base packages, right? Make sure that you're connected to the internet. So in common sense, sorry to repeat that, but we have had that in the past, you know, but let's not go there. So if you do not give any commands in between the two parentheses, what it does, it imports by default all the packages that comes as a base package. So let's say AFI, simple AFI, um, um, there are a few packages that are by default already available. So when you issue this command, it will by default import all of them. If you want to import a very specific package, and you can go to the Bioconductor website and see what are the different new packages that are coming up, and there's a listing of all these packages. If you want to get a specific package, you actually mention the uh, name of that package that you want to import, let's say XYZ, etc., and that package will be imported only. So I'm not going to issue these two commands because it takes about several minutes by the time it connects and uploads it. So if you haven't already done so, make sure in your R session you have issued these two commands and your packages are available. So that's the first thing, you know, how to get to your bioconductor packages. The packages, based on my settings that I have uh, in my uh, Windows-based machine, by default they are actually located in this path. So, so, so when these packages are downloaded in my machine, they're getting downloaded actually in this particular path. So when you are installing it, it will actually give you a prompt to show you, you know, where it's installing it. So take a note of it for your machine, note it down, and and in to to learn more about these packages, and it's actually to go and open these packages in R and see how it's coded. So you get a very good understanding, you know, how how it, how it has been built. So now that's the groundwork. So you connect your bioconductor, you get to your packages, and uh, you get what you need. You know where it's downloaded. So now it's loaded. So let's say one of the base packages I know that comes with bioconductor is named AFI. So what AFI basically does is based on the cell files that you provide and, and a text file where you tell which cell file belongs to which condition that's the phenotype so it constructs an expression set object for you and again I already mentioned to you in, in, the, in your textbook where you need to look to understand what is an expression set object which will also be part of your homework to load the package in your environment the command that you issue is library affi okay so let's do that And I'm not sure whether you are able to see my R prompt, but let me bring it on. <clears throat> okay, so that's simple as that. It loaded the package for you. Now, if you the best way f the, that I have learned. You know, and what's the implementation of these packages? What's done? So 
Last week I showed you that when you're learning R, or you're trying to learn R, and you, you know, want to know what does this function do for me? I, I talked about mean, right? So you use a question mark, question mean. So the best way to learn about a package is to issue this command called open vignette, right? So once you do that, it's going to open up a PDF file. And that's the only way that I know of where you're going to learn what this package does, how it's implemented, what are these functionalities, and they will actually have a, a sample uh, data set and, and, and a sample analysis flow, which will be extremely important for you to read and understand because your homeworks are basically modeled after that. So that's the way I designed the homeworks. I opened up a package, I saw the data set, I saw what they're doing, I just simply changed the data set you know, understand the steps that's needed. So in your homework, you kind of also have to put it together. And the way you will do that is by uh, learning and reading these packages, right? So this is a sample after you did that. So this is the package that's open, the Vignet, so affi.pdf. So it gives you a good introduction. And uh, maybe the, my front is not great here, but you can you can do the same thing on your machine. So that tells you you know, what does it do, how do you get different probe levels data, it has tons of examples, and basically whatever I'm showing you here are derived from many of these examples. So that's the way I learned it, and if you find it useful, you can probably do the same thing too. Okay, so that's how you learn about packages. Second thing is, I also showed you in the last time, you always have to tell R, you know, where you want R to work from, right? So in this case, if you sorry, so this is you know these are these are the different packages uh, the the vagueness that's available. So BioBase always remember is the first basic package the Bioconductor has developed. So as I was mentioning, R is object oriented. So you have your uh, given object types of vector, frame, list, etc. So on top of that, a particular package builds another object. So the first object, the, or the base object or mother object, whatever you want to call it, the bioconductor built is called biobase. So that's the base object. So if you want to know what is biobase all about, just type 6, right? So that's the first thing I would do. So it would open up a vignette for bioconductor overview. And then it opens the PDF file. It tells you in what directory you know it's actually stored. So these are the selections that you can do. So so BioBase is your basic package, and then ba on, on top of BioBase you actually build the AFI package. And the AFI package actually helps you to put together and consolidate your cell files and construct an expression set object. Again. So now you start working at it. So what I did in for this particular example, I have stored today some cell files in my um, R1 directory, R1 directory, right? So there are about 18 cell files. So you can count. So one, two, three, four. So I counted already. So there are 18 cell files. So this is my objective today is to process and show you uh, different features about these cell files. So if you go back to task one and think about it, one of the questions that I ask is go to this uh, gene expression om omnibus or GEO website, right? I give you a, a, a particular experiment and I asked you to open up some cell files, so assuming that you know how to get the cell files. You also need to know what condition each of these cell files belongs to. You know, maybe out of my 18 cell files, none of them, nine of them belongs to something treated with drug. Maybe other nine belongs to not treated with drug. So you can compare between two, uh, two experiments. <clears throat> so that's where I, I have my cell files. So about 18 of them. So what I need to do is I need to tell R to work from my R1 directory. Because by default, you can always find out. So what you do is get working directory. And I showed you last time. So that so because I already was working before, I already changed my session. So right now, my directory is at R1. OK. So now that the cell files are there, the first thing that the AFI does, you have to actually read those cell files. So this is a function called read AFI. This function is coming from the AFI package. Okay. So in this function, if you do not supply any parameter, 
So I told you in my R1 directory there are 18 files. So when you issue this command without any parameter inside this parenthesis, it's going to read all those 18 files, right? It doesn't care. It just goes and loops through all the cell files and build an expression set object. And you always have to care, be careful and understand what function does what. This read AFI that you did is only going to read the cell file and construct an expression set object. It's not going to know that out of these 18 files, how many belong to, let's say, a drug treated condition and how many belong to a non drug treated condition. So for that, you have to actually construct another object. But hopefully we can get to that. So all it's doing right now is reading those 18 files. So let's issue the command x read AFI. Okay, so it's reading the data from your working directory. And because it's 18 files, it's it's taking time, it's looping. <clears throat> and I will let you know when it's done. One thing about R is performance. It's uh, doesn't have the greatest performance and you think about your environment and you're talking about processing thousands of experiments or hundreds of experiments and running it and that's when you get into a, some clustering a Linux cluster and high performance computing uh, but um, that's a bigger topic than you know what this class intends to cover but just uh, think through these things if you can <clears throat> I'm talking about from the industry perspective Still reading. And I haven't been looking if anybody had a question, so I apologize. It's awfully slow today. Boy. Maybe because of the sharing, it's even slower, but um, let's give it more, a couple of more minutes. Okay, so we got done. So now, x is an object, right? So the following commands will show you how to understand what's inside this x. Let's try to understand x here. The way you can understand the object or the structure of an object is by the command str, right? So when you issue a command str, it will tell you what this object is constructed of. So in Bioconductor, each object, when x is an object, is actually constructed of many other base objects. So in our case, you know, AFI that we are using is a class that's built of BioBase. BioBase is probably built up some data frames and vectors and whatnot. So that's the concept you have to get familiar with. So let's just issue the command strx on it, right? And when you do the strx, and don't get intimidated by it, so what it's showing you, under this object x, 
So at CDF, so you have every object has a property, right? So this X has several properties. It has a property where you, is there's a CDF name, meaning what CDF file it belongs to. So in our case, the 18 files that I imported happens to be of the mouse 430 underscore 2 platform. For a human array, it could have been HGU133A platform. And we talked about different platforms in AFI last time. N row and N columns mean on this particular mouse platform that AFI Metrics has, there are 1,000 rows and 1,000 columns, right? Okay. Then F in data, that will actually tell you, you know, how many samples there are. So this is actually constructed of a data dot frame type of base object, right? We talked about data frame object. So Fino data is actually telling you how many particular cell files that you currently have. Because I haven't told yet from the read AFI whether which cell file belongs to which condition. So all it knows right now that there are 18 samples that are here, which is called the add data. So that's the property of your Fino data. But there are more clever, there are other ways where you can actually tell that your Fino data belongs to what particular condition, but we haven't covered that yet, so I'll wait on that. The feature data that actually stores the actual values. So think about it. You have 1,000 rows and 1,000 column, right? So if you multiply 1,002 by 1,002, you get 1,004,404, right? So that's exactly you have. You have that grid. So 1,004,004 observation should be there. So for each of those observation, you're going to have an intensity value. Remember, some of those intensity values are going to be perfect match, and some of them are going to be mismatch. And we talked about the probe pair last week. So if you have 1 million observation, so expect to see 5 million perfect match value, and 5 million, oh, sorry, sorry, guys, half a million perfect match value, and half a million mismatch value. That will constitute your 1 million total observation. That's the total amount of probes that you have in your array. And you also have to remember if that's your probe, you probably have to divide it by 11 to get your probe sets because your probe sets are distributed across the array. So those are the numbers that you have to be clearly able to visualize just so it, you, know, you have a better understanding of what you're doing, right? So that's so that's the command. When you issue the string x, that tells you you know how many rows, what's the CDF file, and what are the names of the files, and you know what are the Fino data. And I also give you note here: thousand by thousand is a million. So expect I expect about half a million PM and half a million MM. So if you want to access a particular attribute, so these are all attributes, right? CDF name, n row, n column. So let's say I'm interested to say, show me just one, the attribute called n row. Show me what's that made of, right? So I supply, I use the function called slot. So slot actually shows you the properties. So when I issue the function slot, and x is my object that I constructed, and n row is the attribute of that object I'm interested to know. So when you're exploring something, so using this str function, slot function, kind of helps you uh, to understand. Okay. So then now, what it tells you is slot n row is actually a number because n row was 1,002 uh, 1, rows, right? So that's a vector. So that's, that's what it's telling you, 1,002. It's a simple property. Now, let's look at the slot of the feature data. So now if you look at the slot of the featured data, so this is actually a class that's constructed out of your annotated, uh, out of your data frame. And data frame, uh, so in Bioconductor, the annotated data frame is actually constructed of the R object data frame, right? And then what you have featured data here, that's actually constructed out of the class annotated data frame, so that you have actually uh, three layers. So on your feature data, you have from 1 to, you. so those are your individual features. As I told you, if you multiply 1,002 by 1,002, you get 1,004,004. So that's the number of features that you have. So these are the features name. It tells you at how many total it is at and what class it's constructed of. Sorry, Stephanie, I mean, I, I don't know what.
you can review the recorded session. I mean, I think, um, okay, so she's left the meeting. Um, <clears throat> now that we know the um, slot, how to look at our slots, right, and how to access our slots, uh, let's look at the CDF name. What, what that is. So CDF name is actually mouse for 302. So that's also a vector, but that vector is a character vector. So 1002 was a number, mouse was a character vector. Uh, the, the feature data is constructed out of a data frame, annotated data frame, which is constructed out of a frame which actually holds all the values, which is 1 million in total. So that's the usage of your uh, string function and your slot function. Now, let's get to a particular probe name, right? So, x is your object which you read based on your read affi, right? So, now if you use the function probe names x, right? So, that will actually return you all the probe names that are available on your mouse array. So, let's do that. And once we did that, now if you look at your probe names, so these are all the probe names, right? So you should have about uh, up to half a million, right? Because you have your million features, so half a million perfect match, half a million mismatch, so in total you have about half a million probes. And these are the names of the probes. And some of them are duplicated because all of them together is your probe set. So over here you see seven seven nine eight seven seven. So these are two probes. So perfect match probe, mismatch probe, and then that could also be located in some other position. Let's assume it's over here, right? This one and this one. So that's your probe set. That's distributed. And so, <clears throat> so now that I know my probe names, how about trying to figure out? Show me a value. Show me any value of a perfect match from anywhere. Right? So to get the probe names, you use the probe names function on your x object. To get just the perfect match values, you use the pm function on your object x. So pmx will give you all the perfect match values. So if you look at your x.pm now, it should give you half a million perfect match values. So R will probably show you the first 6,000 rows and it will tell you that you know 400,000 some rows are omitted right so that's what it does so 400,000 nine you know for yeah 49,000 what is it 490,913 rows are omitted and the other um, 10,000 rows you know you can actually see the perfect match value uh, and I will now it's when you do that in R it's not really clear what's the header and and what's the column name and what this particular thing is so one thing that i do when i want to know the first few rows of a particular display in r i can and those of you who know unix you know you use the head and tail command so head shows you the first few rows and the tail shows you the last few rows. So if you want to question head and understand how this proper function works in R, you're, you're welcome to do it this way. But um, so let me just show you, you know, what the first few row looks like for a perfect match and mismatch. So let's also do the mismatch one over here. So it'll do the same thing. It'll emit about 400,000. I'll show you the first, uh, you know, few records. But if I want to show the first 10 rows of, of mismatches, I can actually display a head command. And if you want to see the bottom 10 rows, you can actually do the tail command. So that's how the head looks like. Head command looks right. So this is actually you have 18 cell files, right? So what it's doing? So for each of those cell files header is listed, so first cell file, second cell file, and you have 18 different sections for that, because that's how many cell files I have. And it's going to list the first 10 rows, because that's what I told them to do, right? So n equals to 10. So it's displaying the first 10 rows. And what these are, these are internal index number for each of these rows. So you have, let's say, from 1 to a million. So 755778 is actually, that's the index, that's the exact probe location that's showing over here. It doesn't do an order from, let's say, 1 to a million, but that's the way it's displaying. So that's the position or the index of your particular probe. This is the value of the probe, and this is the name of the cell file.
So I'm getting to sort of the way I started the task one because I wanted you to get a cell file. I wanted you to know what's the CDF for those cell files. I wanted you to open up a particular cell file and show me an intensity value of a perfect match or a perfect mismatch. Now I haven't heard back from any of you, but I'll be glad to hear to see what your experience was when you used a tool other than R. So from what I am showing you, did you find the usage of tool much easier or what you're going to work now on based on this uh, it seems to be a little easier. Uh, so if you can have some feedback, um, I can only appreciate that. All right. So that's the head. And uh, let's just also look at the structure of the x.probeNem. So everything is, uh, uh, you know, as I mentioned to you, is an object. So x.probeNems is I took the object x, right? And I gave you the probe name. So that's now my new object, x.probeNames. So if I want to further interrogate, what does x.probeNames was? So x.probeNames was nothing but a character vector. So you had it up to from one to, let's say, half a million. And that's the name of all the probe names. So anytime you want to interrogate a particular object, always use the structure function. So x.pm, so my assumption, guess here, it's going to be a numeric object. A vector object because it stores the mismatch values and there's going to be about half a million of them. So let's look at that, right? No, so actually what it is, it's actually a list, right? Because on the first column, it's actually storing all the index, right? So this is your index, right? And on the second column, it's actually storing all the um, um, name of the cell files. So the way the x.pm object is constructed, it's actually based on a list, right? So of that list, it has a property of your cell file name and your index name. So as you do your next homeworks, it's going to be so critical because you are going to, you really have to know what's the structure or of or the object that you're dealing with. So when you are trying to extract, right? For a cell file, a particular index and its value, you have to know these properties, right? Because if you don't know these properties, whether it's a list type or vector type or matrix type, you will not be able to access it. And there will be a lot of struggle in that way. So pay attention and, and interrogate and issue this command and try to really understand you know, what you're trying to access and under what context. It can only help you. So your object of x.pm, again, it's a character object with your list object with one of the columns showing cell file names and another one, the index of those. Now, I know x.probe names was what? Well, it was a, a character vector, right? Because it was half a million of them from 1 to 400,000. So if I want to see the first one of them, right? So what I will do is x.probe names 1 because it's a vector and you know how to access the element in vector, right? And it's in your homework. You use the two brackets and, and there are about one to a half a million elements of character probe sets name of them. So if you want to access the first element, you just access it by one. So once I do that, so the name of the first probe here is underscore AT. If you want to get the hundredth element instead of one, you use a hundred here. So accessing something from an element vector is very easy. You use uh, two brackets here, right? Access an element, accessing an element out of a list, you probably used to have it, have a dollar, right? So we will get to that also when we practice my our homework one. Now, so now we got our first probe name. That's the probe name, and now. I know I showed you that my x.pm, right, which is uh, my perfect match values, that has one column with indexes, that's a list, and it also has a column with the cell file names. So if I want to get the column names, right, right, if I want to get the column names of x.pm, the first column, so it should actually, in theory, give me this one, which is the first cell file. So this is my, so it has one attribute where the indexes are there, and then it has another attribute where all the column names are here. So if I say column names one, right, so it should actually return to me this first one. So what I do here is my column names, PM1, 
what it should do, exactly what it does. Based on this, it gives me the cell file name. Your indexes are on the row side over here. So if you do now a row names one, so it should probably return this one. Okay. So now let's do a row names PM1. So we do that. So that gives you an index. So as simple as that. So now this, let's follow the transition. First, I got the probe name from my probe names one. Then I know, so because that's my x dot probe name is again a character object, vector object. So when I do a, you know, double bracket one, I can access element out of that vector object. Over here, x dot pm is a list object. So of that list object, you have to do a structure and find out what are the different components or elements that that list has. The list has a cell file name component, which is in the column, and it has a <coughs> index component, which is on the row. So by issuing the column name, you get the cell files, and you can issue in the row names, you can get the indexes. Then if you know which one is in column and which one is in row, you just issue the head command like the way I did, visualize your structure, you know, interrogate your structure by the structure function, then accordingly use either the column name or the row name function to get either the cell file or the index. Now, if you want to get to the value level, right? So that's your column name. And this is your row name, 757788. So by accessing just uh, column names one will give you this. Row names one will give you that. But inside a matrix, right, which is this element, matrix, if you do one comma one, right, that will actually return the value, which is 95. Again, column name returns you this. Row names returns you that. And inside the matrix 1, 1, which is a position, first column, first row, will return you that. If you use 1, 2, so that means uh, first row, second column will give you that. So if you use 2, 1, which is second row, first column, will give you 482. If you use uh, 5, 1, that will give you 165. So that's the way you sort of, you know, kind of access exactly what you want to. So now here, x.pm, if I do that, that gives me 589. So what do we conclude? What I conclude here is that the first probe that I looked at, which is x probe names 1, which is named 141508t, has an index, right, or column pos or row position of 7054476, uh, right, which is this one, the row names 1. So that's your row position. The name of the cell file for that particular first probe is this emacs788.cell. Uh, and the value, which is by, done by the position 1, 1, is actually 589. And that's exactly what I wanted you to go through the, uh, um, assi uh, the, the task 1. Okay. Now, we have half an hour. So what I want you to do, and I'm not going to cover this one at this particular session today, but that's how we will start our next session. So what we will do next week on Wednesday, we will first review the solution that we have from homework one. So we'll go through line by line all the codes that I, you are asked to do for homework one. Then I'm going to do this exercise for simple AFI. So what this exercise is going to do, today I showed you some very gentle introduction to Bioconductor. That is, you know, you understand an object, how it's read and what's an expression set, you know, how you read a particular probe set, how you find a mismatch or, per, or a perfect match value for it, and how do you access the element from a list and etc. So next session, what we will start with is we will start with, let's say, 10 samples ten, or 5 cell files. Then we'll construct a text file, which is covdesk.txt. And let me show you what this text file is. This text file is actually the pheno data, right? That tells you which cell file belongs to which condition. And let me briefly show you so it makes so you can make some connection to it. <clears throat> so 
So what you do here, you list out your 10 cell files. So let's say you go to a particular experiment in gene expression omnibus, GEO, right? So you have 10 cell files. And so let's say the five cell files belong uh, to su uh, subjects you know, who were lean diabetics, and the other five subjects were obese and had diabetes. And you try to compare your lean subject versus your obese subject. And let's say the lean subjects did not have diabetes, but the obese subjects had diabetes. So now you compare across these two samples to understand, does any gene play a role? And is there any correlation between someone being obese and having that diabetes? So let's say that's some of the experiment that you want to do. So when I showed you read AFI, right, so that just simply read your cell file. It doesn't know what particular cell file belongs to what condition. But inside your read AFI with a parenthesis, if you, fi if you supply a file called treat.txt, that will not only read the cell file, but at its phenodata attribute, it will remember that my these first five, five cell files belong to the lean condition, and my other five cell files belong to the obese condition. So that's your um, uh, AFI package. What we will work with next week is going to be the simple AFI object. And what I highly recommend is um, for you to go look up this manual, and this is an amazing source of data for Bioconductor Workshop for you, which is you should go and search in Google by GERC Lab, UC Riverside, and I give you a website here, and over there, there is a lot of manual that kind of exposes you, you know, how to work with Bioconductor. There are a lot of examples that you can walk through. So, so you'll find it very, very useful. So if you get the chance, beside reading the lecture, make sure you go to the UC Riverside GERC Lab Bioconductor course and review his material and review some of the uh, case studies that's available that can only help you and that will be another tool for you to understand bioconductor in more depth. So that's what we will do. We will work with 10 files and, and we will do a full analysis, right, where we will actually read the file, we will construct a phenodata to know which file belongs to which conduction. Then we will actually do a RMA a summarization. Remember, last time we talked about RMA, GCRMA, and MASS-5. So we will use one of those. And then um, we're going to do some experiment of full changes and some QCs, right, and do some plotting. And so that will be a real analysis uh, that uh, I want to expose you to next week after we do the uh, homework review for session one. So it's about 7.35 today. I know I'm ending a little early. But does anybody have any question that you guys want to discuss from last week or so far any feedback or observation? OK, so I guess not. So I also sort of wanted to very quickly maybe review the Excel file, since we have a little bit of time. So let's, let's do that. <clears throat> and this was actually a task, so you are not graded on it. But let me look at this one. <clears throat> And I will post it also, so you can look at it. So what happens here, so this is the way you can actually visualize, right, before you even start doing things into, into R. So on the task, what you saw, so we talked about how microarray data in your cell file is basically a matrix or, uh, or an array, right? So on the... So this is actually a good example of data frame. And I'm sorry, in matrix, you always have to have the same data type. Apologies. So this is actually a good example of the data frame. So you have the same number of values across right, for each of those samples. So all of them, let's say, have, I don't know, 10,000 probes that you have. So on your column-wise, if you go down all the way, you have 12,000 or some columns right over here. Uh, sorry, rows. So those are your probe sets. Okay. Then you have, these are your samples. 
So these red, two red samples are related, but they are from the fetal brain, from the right. So there are two of them. The, from an adult brain, you took two samples. From the liver, you took two samples for a fetal sample, and from an adult, you took two samples from the liver. So that's a good description of the experiment, and. <clears throat> And in the row wise, you have actually all of your probe sets. So when we talk about the expression set object, right, it's nothing but in R, they're actually constructing this Excel like storage of data. So that expression set object, when you issue a read AFI command and tell R which cell file belongs to which condition, it actually stores the data into a data frame, where in the columns you have the sample names and in the rows you have your if you, if your probes. Now each of them has actually a value here. So let's say this one has 11.5, this one has 18.8, but a lot of work went into for you to actually get to this 11.5. Remember from the last experiment, right? If you're talking about this fetal brain one, let's say was collected in area one, so when you're talking about this particular probe set's hair, right? So that particular probe set was there was about 11 of them. So when I ask you to do this analysis, I might ask you to say derive this number 11.5 based on mass 5. So if you're doing a mass 5, so your algorithm inside what's happening is it's going through all the 20 pro, 11 probes, is subtracting the mismatches from perfect match, and whenever there's a mismatch that's actually greater than perfect match, is actually using the tucky by weight function to adjust it so your mismatch is never greater than perfect match. If it's a RMA method or a D chip method, right, and I also talked to you about that, it's actually constructing a model based on you know how all of your probe sets shows the similar graph or plot across all of your arrays. So it's actually calculating different parameters to build a model and based on that model it's actually predicting that my value is 11.5. So after combining all those different probe sets for a particular array which is one array you actually and for a probe set you actually end up deriving to a single number. Now that you have derived to a single number, you have to actually normalize this number compared to the other arrays. So just because you have 11 here and let's say you have 100 here does not mean right, that there is a differential expression because there could be contamination, there could have been uh, over more samples on your second array. So in that scenario, if you use the RMA method, I might ask you to say, you know, do a, uh, in a quantile uh, normalization, right? Or if you're using D chips, I can say, you know, this normalization that you have to use has to be derived based on the housekeeping genes you have, so which is the invariant set normalization. So pay very specific attention on the pre-processing of data to say what kind of method are you using? Is it RMA, GCRMA, or DCHIP? What kind of normalizations that you are using? Is it uh, uh, um, uh, Lois adjusted normalization for two-color array, or is it a quantile normalization? Is it uh, your invariant set normalization, etc. So in this particular simple example, what you actually did is you actually calculated a trimmed mean for all of this, right? So you report, so you went all the way down at your 12,000 row, right? So you calculated the trimmed mean, and there's the formula for trimmed mean. You exclude the first 2% and the bottom 2% of the value, right? And then you calculate it based on the, this range. And you also have a formula for a mean and median, but which you are not using. Now that you calculated your raw value, then you can actually, then you actually normalize. Right? So when you normalize it, so over here, you still have how many arrays? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Right? So when you're normalizing, you still have 8, one, two, so 8 of them. But for each of the values that you initially had in your raw, so let's say over here your raw was 564.3, you actually divide it by the trim min, right, by the trim min. So once you divide each of your value by the trim min, your raw value get adjusted to a normalized value. 
So you still have eight arrays, but you now replace your raw value to the normalized value. And remember, your raw value was actually coming either from a MAS4, MAS5, or RMA-based algorithm. Then what you do is you do a ratio. So in the ratio, what you're actually comparing, you're combining the brain tissue and liver tissue together. So what you're doing here from your normalized value, so you combine the brain, this one, so you have four of them, your brain one and brain two, and your adult brain one and brain two, so you take a mean of these two, you take a mean of this two, and you divide it by this two. So I think this next step that you have to actually do is the mean. So you go, you started with eight here. Over here, you're still eight, but when you do the mean, your eight becomes four. Though, so all you're doing is you're combining the one and two into one fetal brain, brain one and two into one adult brain, one fetal liver based on these two, and one adult liver. So all you're doing is your eight uh, array value now gets reported into four of them. So that's your mean, right? And the last thing that you do on ratio then, then you compare your fetal brain mean with the adult brain mean. So, so you divide this one by that one. And then you compare your fetal liver mean with the adult liver mean. So you divide by 7.4 to 8.4, okay? So you started with eight. Over here, you're four. And finally, for the ratio, you go into two. So clearly follow the transition, right? 8 to 4 to 2. And now that you get the 2, the final thing you have to do, you have to report this ratio into log, right? So that's what you do, finally, over here. So you actually do all of these intensity values that you actually started with, with log of this. So that's your eight of, 8 of those. So in the green cell, I'm showing you 4 of these, right? And finally, you take a log of that, of the ratio. So all of the values that you have, you put a log around it. So I will upload this particular assignment that you but I think it made sense to you that, you know, how you have your, how you started with your samples uh, on the column. And when I talk about inset object, this is what I'm talking about. Then you do the mean, so 8 becomes 4, and then finally you compare the ratio, then your 4 becomes 2. And now you ask a question, is this two significant, you know, differentially expressed or not? So in case of full test, full change, what are you going to do? Just simply subtract between this by that, right? So that's going to give you the... Uh, uh, the full change. But if you want to do a t-test, it's one gene at a time, right? So for each of them now, then you're going to have a t-test value. So let's say over here you have a t value of 3.8, over here you have a test value of 0.1, maybe that relates to a p-value of 0.03, p-value of 0.67, maybe a p-value of 0.01. So then you establish a criteria of p-value 0.05. So the only gene that's going to show up as differentially expressed are, is going to be this one for 0 0.03 and this one for 0 0.01. The, the one with 0 0.678 is not going to show up. And that pretty much should give you a very good idea of you know, what we're going to do next week and what our homework is going to be about, which is the homework two. So hope deadline for homework one again is on February 21st, I think, which is Monday. I do not accept or grade any homework that's submitted delayed, so I'm very strict about that. So if you submit your homework on time, I'll review it, I'll get it. If you submit it not on time, not look at it. Uh, so that's your And your homework too, regarding the simple AFI and about your ability to take a text file or Excel file, right? So I'll simply give you an ex a text file, which will have a lot of sample column uh, and a lot of the row and you actually have to create an expression set object from the scratch. So there will be two sections of that homework. And on the second section of the homework, I will give you some cell files. It's a small class. So what I can do, I can actually tell you to pick up your own cell file. So that way I know homeworks are getting done independently. I do not encourage collaboration in homework. So don't copy each other's work. I do encourage a lot of collaboration during the project that you'll 
do. But if I see the same method of code or same you know analysis of code, I'm going to get back to you to sh to tell you that your code looks awfully similar to the other person's code, and there is no probability that both of you have named of your object the same way. So please try to work independently and do not uh, uh, do not uh, borrow or share from each other's homework solution. Um, so that's pretty much it. So I'm going to end now, unless there isn't any last minute question. Okay? And if you have questions, if you have some clarification, always feel free to reach out to me via email. And, and um, I look forward to uh, speak to you guys next week uh, on Wednesday. And enjoy. Uh, have a good night.